Larry's not as tall as me. <laughs> he said he's my brother, right? So I'm supposed to be able to do that. Um, good morning. It is definitely a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. I was uh, asked, I was told that I can make myself at home, which is easy. Um, why? Because I'm one of God's children in his house. So um, to your pastor in his absence, I thank him for the invite. Um, I have family here. My parents are here. My aunt is here. My adopted parents, the Fowlers from Watson, are here, and the hardest working, most beautiful woman in Louisville, Kentucky, is here. That is my wife, Vicki. Um, I don't take anything for granted, you all, um, I, especially your time. Let me tell you why. I was here a few weeks ago when Delasia was baptized, actually. So this is, my fir this is not my first time here. Um, but her sister, um, I, went to, I went to brunch with them, and I'm actually more afraid of Jade than I am of most people on earth. And Jade said that she has about a 30-minute window in which she's able to give somebody attention. So I promise Jade I will not be 31 minutes today because I cannot have Jade on my bad side. So um, I promise I won't be long today. Um, I do want to open us. I, want, I do want to open in prayer before we get right into the scripture. Father God, I thank you for the privilege to come into your house, God. Father God, if I could just ask you to do one thing, and that's just remove me from the, from sight, speak through me, so that what what need, what you want to be heard is heard, God. Uh, the word that I do that I would like to present, God. I want. I wish that lives are changed from what they hear convict people in their sins father god conform them to your way but most importantly lord transform them to walk in your will these are all things that i ask in your son jesus name amen so today um scripture today is going to come from luke chapter 9 sermon is really only coming from one verse and that's chapter 20 chapter 9 verse 23 and in that, Christ says, and he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You may have your seats. I want to start, I just want to ask, start this sermon off by asking you all one question. Are you a fan? Or are you a follower? Mm, yeah, are you a fan? Watch this. We are in Louisville, Kentucky. And there's a whole bunch of fans in here. What I yeah, thank you. I heard that. Yes. I know that there's some Cardinal fans in here. I see shirt I see shirts where it says University of Louisville. There are people in here who know more who are Louisville fans. Maybe there's a two or three Kentucky fans in here. And we, and, and the Lord asks us to love people despite their character flaws, and we do that too. <clears throat> you might be an Ohio State fan, a Florida State football fan, whatever fan you are. LeBron James, L.A. Laker, Boston Celtic, whatever you are a fan. You can identify with a whole lot of things as fans. The one thing that happens as fans, though, no one ever asks you to determine your relationship. Define your relationship as a fan, do they? Nah. When you, de when you define the relationship of what you are, here's what you, you end up at a crossroads. Define the relationship. As How many married men in here? Raise your hands real quick. At some point in your life, you had to define the relationship with your wife. And when she asked you to, you probably got a little nervous because you were kind of forced to figure out whether or not it was you were casual or committed. Or committed. 
I am at the committed church, right? At some point in your relationship with Jesus Christ, you have had to determine whether that you were casual or you're committed. Well, I came to tell you today, Christ has no, new, has no use for casual, casual Christians. He doesn't need fans. He needs followers. And in this scripture today, there are three things that I want to give you to help you determine whether or not you are a fan or a follower. The first thing you see there in chapter 23, it says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must first deny himself. Yeah, deny yourself. What's that look like? What's that mean? To deny yourself means exactly that. To think about all the things in your life that make you comfortable, the things that you want, which is countercultural, you all. We live in a world where we're not encouraged to be self-denying. Everything we're told is to be self-fulfilled. It's all about me, ain't it? If you're, an, if, if you're a fan of athletics, you see guys, you see basketball guys, they, they dunk a ball and then they go, it's all about me. Right? That's not what Christ asked. He says to deny yourself. You, 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 we look for comfort when trying to pursue anything. Think about, think of, when's the last time you were uncomfortable? Even when you come, even when we come to churches, we even design our churches for comfort. Think about the, when's the last time you went to a church and you sat on a real hard pew. We're, we're created to comfort ourselves. I don't want, I can't go, let the AC go out of here right now. We'll cancel meetings, we'll cancel services. If it, if it rains too hard, if the wind blows too hard, so churches get canceled. If, if there's too much snow, if there's a little snow on the ground, we don't come. If, if, if I can't be comfortable, then I don't know that this is the place for me. What kind of temperature gauge does that show that we have as, quote, followers of the king? We even... Our comfort is so important to us that we've even created things like, y'all remember the Snuggie? Think about what a Snuggie is. A Snuggie is a blanket with sleeves. As if taking off the blanket to get to the TV remote was going to kill you for being just a little uncomfortable. We even create things to even make our whole lives convenient and comfortable. But Christ tells us right away that, that if you want to follow him, you're going to have to sacrifice that comfort. Later on in this chapter, he encounters another person who says they want to follow him. And he, has, he tells them that foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. That means you're going to be uncomfortable. Not you won't, there's sometimes you might be homeless when you choose to follow Christ. If you choose to follow Christ, you have to be uncomfortable. Watch this. If you want to be comfortable, become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Denying yourself means it doesn't matter what you want. It don't matter what you want. Watch this. The world already doesn't care what you want. So since the world doesn't care, why would you expect Christ to care what you want? Oh, but brother preacher, he says he gives me the desires of my heart. 
Yeah, he does. But according to how he wants you to have it. So to follow Christ, first, the first thing you have to do is deny yourself. Now, before, to help you really get down to the, the denial of that thing, you actually have to, you have to recognize where your, where, where your center is. Who's at the center? Are you, are you self-centered or Christ-centered? In the church, we sing, Jesus is the center of my joy. Do you really mean it? Do you, have you ever really thought about what those words say? The, the, the lyrics say, you're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. If he's the heart of your contentment, those words alone mean Whatever I need, God, you provide, and I, my joy is centered in whatever you give me. That's what those words mean. Kind of hits a little different when you, really, when you really hear the lyrics right there, don't they? So be very careful about singing the, singing the songs of the church. If you don't mean them, don't sing them. Deny yourself. We're just talking about trying to be a genuine follower, ladies and gentlemen. Deny yourself. The second thing in the scripture tells you, it says, if, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily. The cross. There's one right there. You can go out pretty much however many churches you passed on the way in here. At the top of every church, there's a cross. Um, we carve crosses in headstones. We engrave them in jewelry and rings. They hang from chains. We get tattoos of them. But Christ is not talking about something that you wear, carry, put in your pocket, stick on your car on a bumper sticker. In, in Jesus' day, the only reason a person picked up a cross was to die. Let me say that again. The only reason why a person picked up a cross in Jesus' time was to die. He later explains in, in verse 24, if anyone tries to save their life, they will lose it. But if they give up the li their life for his sake, they will save it. Christ is saying to be one of, one of my followers, you must be all in. You don't take up your cross for just an hour on Sunday morning. Or... 45 minutes on Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever Bible study is, or the half hour that you might come for Sunday school, or the half hour that I'm in an FCA huddle at a school. That's, that, that's a partial taking up of my cross. Taking up the cross daily means you have to be willing to kill your sin every day. And all of us have some kind of vice or some kind of sin that we struggle with Daily, I hope. Because if you aren't struggling with your sin, that means you have a past tense verb. You struggled, and guess what? That means you are physically dead. So you are, if you are struggling in your sin, <laughs> praise God that you're struggling. Because you have something that you need to be saved from. But if you've got an ED in your Christian walk, that means there's going to be a hearse coming in here some, soon. There's going to be a, a casket laying in here. Make sure as you are committed to following Christ that you've denied yourself and you're dedicated to following him. Mm. Picking up the cross, 100% dedication. He doesn't want some of it as, as the song by the, I believe it's called uh, the Forever Jones. He wants it all. As y'all see, I am a music person. He wants it all, not a little bit, all of it. As Christians, many of us don't have an issue with dedication. We are simply dedicated to the things that we shouldn't be. So we say things, I, we say things like, I want to follow Jesus, but don't ask me to forgive the person who hurt me. 
Don't ask me to release that resentment and bitterness. I just can't let that go. Mm. No, beloved, it's not, it's not that you can't let it go. You won't. I love Jesus, but that area of my, that area of my life, uh, I'm not, I don't know if I can, no. I'm not really, I'm not really, I don't know that I'm really willing to do. Then that means you're not 100% committed. If you can, if you can consider all the things that you don't want to do, then I don't know that you're dedicated to Christ. I got, here's a news flash, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the only place where you can have things your way is BK. Yeah. If you want it your way, go, go buy a Whopper. As a matter of fact, when you're praying, if, if, you, if you're setting out to do ministry and you're comfortable and you feel like it's everything that you said, you probably need to pray again. I'm, I'm almost willing to bet Christ didn't tell you to do that. We wear the name Christian, then we want to pick and choose the teachings of Jesus that we're willing to follow. As if the scriptures were a buffet and we can go through and just simply pick off pick and put on our plate and eat what we want to eat. I'm sorry, my brothers and sisters. It doesn't work that way. We do have, he does give us all of these things to choose from, but guess what? He chooses them for, for us and then he leads us to them. Notice, notice the verb there. It says lead. In order for one to lead, someone sub subsequently has to we all grew up playing a game, says Simon says, and everybody wanted to be Simon. Very few people wanted to follow. I, I want to be Simon. Why? Because I want to be able to tell Larry what to do. And if Larry don't do what I say, he's out. Isn't it, isn't it so refreshing to know that, and be, aren't we grateful to God that he does not lead us that way? Because if, it, if he did, man, I'd be talking to an empty building right now. Because every time we do something our way, it is sin and it, it, we are separated from him and we deserve to be killed right then. Yeah, that's what happens when we don't do what God says. God says left, we go right, dead. That's what we deserve. But thanks be to God that he, he gives us grace. We've not, we gotta, Christ is not looking for half-hearted followers. He has no interest in just Sunday Christians. He explains that following him is not something we can do part-time or halfway. Jesus says all or nothing. We can look at the life of Paul as an example for this. In Galatians 20, 20, he, t he tells us this. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, there's somebody who's dedicated to Jesus. Jesus said to take up your cross daily. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives, lives in me. This is the kind of life Jesus wants to have with us. When we die to ourselves and live for him, we find lives that are truly worth living. So ask yourself, who, who am I living for? So we find the first difference between a fan and a follower is denial. The second is dedication. And that third is simply direction. The last part of the verse in, it is the direction. Follow me. Now, this is the obvious part of Jesus' Jesus's challenge, but it also can be the most difficult. Yeah, we've already covered that, right? Why is it hard? Well, because you're asking me to, de to deny myself. I got to do the things that I, I don't. I got to do the things that I don't want to do. Then, I, then adding to that, I got to be dedicated. Huh. Now, here's the thing about dedication. We, we ded we're dedicated to work. We're dedicated to 
hobbies. We're dedicated to collections and cars and there are some people who are more, who are more dedicated to washing their car than they are reading their Bibles. So again, dedication is not the problem. It's not, it's not, it's not being dedicated. And we, and we, we also can follow. <clears throat> now the problem about following is outside of the church, we don't usually use the word disciple unless you happen to be a teenage, mid-twenties young person and you're a member of something called the Hive. Y'all know, y'all, y'all know who's the who, y'all know who's the, who's the queen bee in control the control of the hive, don't you? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. This is Sunday morning, and y'all can't say that name in here. Yeah, Beyonce. Yeah, so Beyonce has disciples. LeBron James has disciples. There are some people who know more about Beyonce and LeBron James than they know about Christ. They know when his birth. They know they know when his his or her birthday is and. They know how many, t- how, many, how many points he scored and when he scored his first point, his last point, how many assists he had on, July t- on August 25th, 1973. That was zero because he wasn't born then. But the point is they know more about LBJ than they, do, than they know about the king of the world. But discipleship was very common in Jesus' day. He was a Jewish rabbi with Jew- Jewish disciples. These, these disciples learned the Torah at a long, young age. Y'all, see, y'all hear that? They learned the Torah at a young age. Hmm. At around 14 or 15, they graduated, and they felt call, if they felt called into ministry, they would go to the rabbi, rabbi and say, I want to be one of your disciples. Now, most are turned away, but a few hear the rabbi say, come follow me. So the young disciple would leave his family, friends, and the synagogue to devote their entire life to literally following in the footsteps of their rabbi. Being a disciple meant not just learning what the the rabbi knows, but learning what he does. Think about that. Not just learning what he knows, but learning what he does. This is what Jesus is challenging us to do, to follow in his steps, to teach what he taught, and to do what he did. Now, we obviously cannot physically follow him in the way the early disciples did. But Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 2.21, he wrote for us, he wrote, for to do this, you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. How do you follow Christ's steps? You just, you, just, you just simply open it, read it, and go do it. He, gave, he gives us the blueprint. No, Jesus Christ is not physically walking earth, and you cannot put one foot in his footsteps. Of course not. But you, do, you can follow. We are expected to follow his word. How? Letter by letter, noun by noun, verb by verb, period by period, by every single word in here. This is truth. Now, I know we have a problem with the word truth in 2023 because we've been convinced that there's something called an alternative truth. Well, newsflash, that's a lie. Anything that is alternative of the truth is a lie. So watch this. You, and you, watch this. You do not have to have some long degree to do that. If you can just get a dictionary and go look up the word truth, the opposite of is a lie. It doesn't, it doesn't, we don't need a whole bunch of extra words to try to figure that out. It's just a lie. So Anything that someone said that tells you that Jesus said that's not in here, it's a lie. And it's you are not to follow. Really simple. So that last question, I want you to ask yourself, and this is a this is a ponder sermon. So you 
Ask yourself, whose footsteps are you following in? Ask yourself this question. When was the last time you asked, what would Jesus do? And it wasn't really a cultural cliche. It wasn't something that you put on. I mean, y'all remember, y'all remember that? Watch this. Y'all remember that fad of, the, of, of WWJD? Y'all see, how sad, y'all see how sad and sorrowful that ought to make us feel? That we, we made what would Jesus do a, the, the, the cultural symbol of T-shirts, bracelets, bookmarks. We even have the audacity to have them as bookmarks, bookmarks in our Bible. But when's the, really, when's the last time you really ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And you meant it. Rather than to um, sarcastically chastise somebody who um, checked you for being wrong. Oh, what would Jesus do? We use it as a, we use it, we use that as a phrase of justification. So I can justify me doing wrong. Well, what would Jesus do? Jesus wouldn't check me with that. Well, see that 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 tells us how much we don't know about Jesus. They really just that's just a really convicting a convicting statement for us, you all. We we will come for the necks and the heads of people who are holding us accountable to what we say we believe, and then we will say, Jesus wouldn't do that. Well, I got sixty six books in this here thing that tells me that, that and I've look, I've read this book twice. And I don't know that I've ever seen in here where Jesus has allowed me to do anything that I want and not be checked. Well, the Bible says I can't, that, that, not to judge people. No, that's not what that says. It says judge with the measure that you would, that you would be judged. It tells, you to, it tells you to check the plank in your own eye before you consider the speck in somebody else's. That, that is accountability. That's part of following Christ. So watch this. Okay, so checking my jade meter. Real followers of Jesus don't just love Jesus and talk about Jesus. They learn from him. They live their lives in the way he lived his life. Jesus gave three things that separate a fan from a follower. That that is denial, dedication, and direction. Now, as I'm I'm coming to an end, I told you I wouldn't be long. Because sometimes when you get in it, you just get in it and you go sit down. That leaves us with one last D. The decision. Remember, Jesus started off saying, if any of you wants to be my disciple... That means before he even finishes his sentence, we have a decision to make. It's really simple. And and watch this. I work in customer service, and I ask a lot of closed questions. Closed questions are questions that just require one-word answers. That question is, do you want to follow Jesus? Requires a yes or a no. Maybe maybe it's not a, maybe it's not applicable in, with do you questions. Watch this. Do you love chicken? Yes. Right. Are you breathing? Yes. Do you want to follow Jesus? It requires us. Yes. Thank you. It requires the same type of response. 2,000 years later, the invitation hasn't changed. Jesus still says if anyone would come, you know what I like the word anyone? It means just that. It means it's all in this world of inclusion, everybody's included. Anyone is anyone. Anyone can answer the call. Everyone is invited, someone will say yes.
which also means someone will say no. But no one has the excuse of not, of not responding. Because in your, if, if you are a person in here, and I pray everyone in here has said yes, but if you're a person in here who is considering and you're waffling, you're on the fence, and you say, oh, I got time. Well, I'll ask you, ever been to a funeral? If you have, ever been to the funeral of someone who didn't make a decision? We often say tomorrow's not promised, but do we really believe it? No, we take for granted that this... take for granted that the exhale is promised to you. It's not. Some of our loved ones today went to sleep and never woke up. Some of your friends said, oh, I'll get to it tomorrow. And the Lord called, and that's a call that you got to take. There ain't no call waiting when the, when the Lord calls. You, 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 you can ignore your parents when they call you, you can ignore your husband when he calls, you can ignore your best friend when he calls, you can ignore Pastor Hayes when he calls. But when Jesus calls, there ain't no ignore button for that. So there's a decision. And guess what? It is the most, most important decision you will ever make in your life. To decide whether or not when, when the Lord calls, do you get to wake up on that side of glory? I, I, would, I would implore you that if you have no idea where you're going to go, should, the God, should, the, should God call you, you need to make the decision to follow him. Is it easy? No, it's not. Will you still commit sin? Yes, you will. But here's the beautiful thing about that. The beautiful thing about the cross is that Jesus went there knowing that he was the only person able to drink from his daddy's cup of wrath. That's the best news ever, that he drank a, he drank a cup that I couldn't fathom to drink. Whether he won and the, and he wrestled because he he did go in, Gets, in Gethsemane and say, if it if this could be taken from me, take it. But then there's that long bunch of words, that bunch of words, nevertheless, which is a follow word. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be. I've often said in my, in my, in my professional life that um, people go, what made you, how do you manage the type, how do you manage like you do? Well, I said, quite, it's quite simple. I follow, the, I follow the model that Jesus gave. Jesus, he's never asked us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. Not even willing to do himself that he did. So if you're, as, as we're going through life, trying to figure out whether or not who I need to follow, what do I need to follow? The first place you need to follow, first place you need to look is Jesus. Now watch this. To deny yourself requires, as he's playing, I surrender all. Everybody put your hands up and close fists. A closed fist can't follow anybody because you're holding on. This is, this is what selfishness looks like. In order to deny yourself and to be dedicated and follow direction, you got to surrender. And what is a, what's the surrender position look like? You got to open up your hands. You have to open up, you have to open up your hands because if you are closed, if you closed 
he can't get you because you, this says that I got all I need right here. I surrender all means I'm like this. God, take me as I am. I'm not worth much. But you said, if I follow you, you if I give up my life for you, you will give your life for me. Isn't that better than what you live right now? And if and if and if this world is that so, if, if this world is so great to you, what do you got to lose? This is the ultimate win-win. I can I can give up my life because watch this, y'all. The stuff that you have down here is not the, it's not that important. You came in you came in the world with nothing, and you go out of here with nothing. But there is a promise. That if you say yes to, to my Lord, when he cracks the sky, I get to go back with him. There's nothing better. I'm going to close with this question. Do you want to follow Jesus? Let's pray. Father God, I come before you thanking you for yet the another great opportunity to present your word where God I thank you for challenging us in our discipleship and helping us to consider what it cost to follow you God we're thankful that you despite our plea, our promises to follow you and to be all in and we in our in our flesh God we are often short in following you God but we think we, we're grateful that you still love us anyway and you still live us anyhow Father God we do we do ask you that you don't that you please don't leave us Father God don't turn your back on us Father God we do want to do what you what you would have us to do Lord but our flesh is weak God so strengthen our flesh Father God so that we can have the hearts to dedicate you change our hearts soften our hearts so that we can be emptied of worldly things and filled with yours it is in your precious name, in your precious son Jesus' name I pray, amen.